Uh, I don't think your mic is working. All right, just a second. Yes. Test, test, test. Test, test, test. Is that better? Yeah, I can hear you now. Okay. Yeah, sorry about that. I, I, I definitely have my, my internal microphone is seems to have broken and my external USB one seems to randomly drop sometimes. So yeah, if anybody, you know, if I, if my audio goes again, just a uh, shout out. So, all right, let's get going here. Um, for these, I mean, for these help sessions, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to get questions and, and let students drive them. Uh, this is a relatively big class. And yeah, we've got uh, eight or nine or 10 people here on right now. Um, if, I mean, I know people are, are getting their dev environment set up. That's good. I've seen at least 10 or 12 people uh, at least have been working on that so far. Um, in fact, here's all the people I see that have at least gotten to the step where you've accepted the assignment or at least the, the team name. So, yeah, there's about 10 on there, I think, so far. If you haven't got your dev environment set up and things, you need to get started on that. So, um I did just make an announcement here. I'm gonna. It's, it's it's kind of a requirement that you either get assignment zero completed, or you give me a report today why you, why you don't have it completed yet. So what is the issue that's holding you up, right? Um, and I'll try and do in, individual stuff uh, through email, or maybe jump on uh, Zoom individually with people um, to help them get their Zoom their uh, dev containers set up. Um, or you can use, uh, you can also um, um, talk with uh, Mr. Singh. Um, is is, uh, is uh, Mr. Singh on here? I don't think he's on at the moment. I was hoping he would join these sessions, but uh, here's his email. Um, so, you know, um, um, I'm trying to give him to be more like general tutoring and stuff. So he's trying to work ahead on the assignments. Um, so, you know, if you need to talk with somebody for longer periods of time, especially once we get to the point where you've got your development environment set up um, and, and kind of want some help on doing C++ or working on assignments and things, you can um, maybe see if he can help tutor you a bit or, or something. So. All right, so... Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm recording these sessions. Um, I, I mean, you know, I know this is an online course, so we didn't have a, a set schedule ahead of time. So probably not everybody can make these times, but I will record these and post these onto the official class um, playlist. So hopefully everybody's found those. Um, if you go to the, uh, I think it was in the announcement, but if you go to the um, like additional res resources, I should have links for things, including the, uh, I've, I've got some canned videos of lectures for all the course materials, but I'll also have um, a playlist where I put uh, a separate one where I put on these help sessions uh, that we record. So, uh, but you can find that and other links to things um, on the additional materials. Um, All right, and then, so I mean, usually for these sessions, you know, on Mondays, I tend to concentrate on the problem sets, uh, although try to get people started then talking about the program assignment. And then on Wednesdays, you know, we concentrate on, on questions about the program assignment, okay? So the structure of the class, that this is a five week class session, but we need to cover all the same materials that we normally would on a full 16 week class. So things are a bit compressed. You do need to get things done in, and completed and submitted on time. Um, I really can't accept late work, um, um, especially on you know fast sessions like this. So we're always going to have a problem set due on Tuesday over the unit. Um, and I'll talk about this. I want to try to keep this short today, uh, but we'll see if anybody has any questions about that, because I would like to then talk a little bit about the uh, practice assignment zero uh, and maybe at least mention the, the first programming assignment, programming assignment one that's due on Thursday. Um, and then there is a test over the materials for the uh, um, the unit each week um, that'll be open on Friday. It's, it's like a two or three hour test. I think there's a two hour time limit on this first one. Um, and you have to have it completed. Uh, you have to start it and complete it sometime on Friday or Saturday, whatever works best for you for that. So. Um, question so far on kind of content or the general structure of what we'll be doing so i'm assuming you'll go over how we're going to turn like turn them turn them in and do all that kind of stuff 
Um, sure. Right. So mm -hmm. uh, if we have general questions, I'll try and go over the assignment zero a little bit. There are videos on that as well, where I go over completely go over the practice assignment zero. Uh, but, but yeah, I, I plan to at least talk a little bit about assignment zero here. Also, you know, the, the problem set, let, let's start with that. The problem set, the, the problem sets are just written work. Uh, you turn that in by uploading it to, um, you know, uh, I think might look slightly different when you're running as a student, but if you go to the uh, activities assignment, there should be a submission folder for um, problem set one. Um, so that's where you put the problem set stuff. So um, both. So let me let me like I said, I want to try to keep this relatively quick, but let me let me talk about the first problem set uh, because the first program assignment um, is also. Um, uh, working on this hypothetical machine. Somebody's asking about the textbook. Um, to tell you the truth, um, there's probably electronic um, options. Uh, this, this textbook, the Stallings textbook, is very easy to find um, copies of it. So if you need a PDF copy of it, um, if you do a little Google foo, uh, you can probably find it to hold you off until you can get your um, official version of the textbook. So, um, so back to the problem set. The um, uh, but both the the first written problem set and the first program assignment. We're going to be working with this hypothetical machine. This is from chapter one of our textbook. Okay, so um, it describes. And this is really kind of more like a computer architecture course, but um, this is this is kind of a good starting point for our operating systems course to make certain that everybody kind of has the same sort of concept. So this is describing a hypothetical machine, hypothetical machine architecture, where you know we in theory have some examples of different. Um, opcodes that are uh, supported by the machine architecture, by the circuitry of the CPU, right? So, you know, uh, our textbook talks, you know, we, we've got stand, some standard examples of, um, uh, what's the textbook called these? The, uh, the the category of, you know, the, the, the most used kinds of instructions are things that actually do work. So those are things like um, adds and subtract. So arithmetic logical um, statements, add, subtract, uh, other kinds of arithmetic logical statements are things that are common in machine architecture would be things like bitwise ands or ors or bit manipulation kinds of things. So those are typical um, operations that are supported by a machine um, to do actual work, to actually make calculations, right? Then you have kind of your memory um, thing. So, you know, um, so part of this chapter one and part of um, the goals of our operating system course is that... Um, uh, we're going to learn how the operating system works as a manager of system resources, right? So our main resources that we're going to be talking about are uh, memory uh, and the CPU. So those are kind of two of our big ones that we spend a lot of time on, on how the operating system actually manages those resources and, and um, allows multiple processes to use those. So anyway, so... A, a basic thing of a machine architecture, then are, uh, another set of instructions for getting things in and out of the CPU. So, so usually loads and stores go from what's known as primary memory or RAM uh, to get data in and out. Um, and then you've got kind of a set uh, in, in the hypothetical machine in figure 1.3 um, um, and the example they did in the textbook, it, they didn't have any examples of some jump statements. I added in some jumps, absolute jumps and conditional jumps. So these are examples of flow control statements. So um, the, the normal statements like subtract and add actually modify um, a register on the CPU called the, the accumulator in, in our hypothetical machine here, right? So whenever you subtract something, uh, the, the result of the subtraction ends up in the accumulator. The, the result of doing these, these kinds of statements that change the program flow of control, these actually change the program counter. So if you jump to an address, what you're doing, you're, you're going to be uh, uh, writing the program counter, which is another register um, that, that's um, uh, talked about in this chapter one here. Um, so anyway, yeah, I mean, you, know, I, you, you do need to read kind of through chapter one here, but um, um, uh, let, let me just get kind of started and make sure everybody knows what you're supposed to do for this pr first written problem set. So is, is hopefully, hopefully this isn't too hard, even if you don't have the textbook, uh, you can kind of figure out what's going on here. I mean, all I need you to do is kind of fill out 
uh, these cells for, there, there's like four problems here, um, where um, you're given the contents of memory and the contents of registers in our hypothetical machine architecture, and you have to simulate the fetch execute cycle occurring, right? So um, fetch is very easy. So all that happens on the fetch stage, as this is described in our textbook, is the program counter is going to be uh, pointing to somewhere in memory. So we just fetch whatever's in memory that's pointed to by the program counter into the instruction register, right? So we end up getting 4940 into the instruction register on the fetch phase, right? And then the execute phase um, is much more complicated in a real CPU than the fetch stage. Um, you first have to kind of decode the instruction that's in the instruction register, and then you have to actually execute it. So anyway, um, all the values that are shown here, this, this is described here, I believe, in these hints and things, all these values are actually hexadecimal representations. So you think of, you should think of these as, as hex, right? So in hex, each hexadecimal digit represents four bits, right? So, so the valid hex digits go from zero to F or zero to 15, which represents um, four uh, binary uh, bits from 0000 to 1111, which is 15 or F in hex, right? So anyway, uh, you know, the, the first digit here represents the first four bits. This Our machine architecture, since we have four digits, that means that there's 16 bits on each of these values shown in our hypothetical machine here, right? Uh, our hypothetical machine is kind of a 16-bit machine, um, um, which we don't talk a little bit about what we mean by like a 16-bit architecture or 32-bit architecture. Again, that's more like a computer architecture course, but um, anyway, the, 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 the format of our, the instruction format is that the first four bits represents the opcode, and then the next 12 bits represent an address that the um, opcode um, uses in doing its work, all right? So since each of these represent four bits, the first digit is going to be the first four bits. So that represents the opcode um, that we're going to execute on the execute stage. And then 940 represents the next 12 bits. That's going to be a memory uh, address that we use, uh, that, that we might use for the um, operation, right? Um, so... Anyway, so, so you know, to do these problems, you first have to decode, right? So I don't know. I mean, if you're not real comfortable, like going from binary to hexadecimal to um, um, base 10, you know, if you're not comfortable converting things, this might be a good time to review that. You should have kind of come across that. So anyway, like, like a, a four um, is going to be, so, so this, is, this is one decimal or, or one hexadecimal. Um, you know, because it's two, it's two to the zero here. This is two to the one or, or a two. So this is a two. So stores are twos. Loads are one. Stores are twos. And then this is a two to the two. Uh, um, so this is actually a four here, um, uh, uh, represented in binary, four decimal represented binary. So all that's saying is if you de decode that correctly, we're saying doing a subtract, right? So an example of a subtract is uh, you take the memory, uh, this reference, which is a two, that so you, you're going to take the accumulator, subtract the reference memory value, so it's going to be five minus two. The result then gets stored back in the accumulator of that subtract, right? So, and I, so I gave you the first one there. So you have to just do that, simulate that for all of the fetching. So another implied step here that's shown in the textbook um, is that also another thing that happens on the execute stage is that uh, the program counter is going to be incremented implicitly, right? So the program counter would be 301 by that uh, implicit increment because what the, the normal flow of control when you're executing programs is to execute them sequ sequentially. So you, ex you first execute the instruction at memory address 300, then you execute it at 301 and 302. So by incrementing the program counter on the execute stage as well as executing the instruction, the next fetch we would be fetching from 301, right? So, so the program counter should just be incremented uh, 300, 301, 302, unless you have to execute a jump instruction. So if you execute a jump instruction, that would actually change the program counter from the increment to, to whatever value um, is specified in the address portion. All right. Um, all right, so there were some more hints in these. Um, 
Um, so it is like, like if there's no jump statements, which on this first problem, there might not be any jump statements. Um, you would might execute 300 for the first fetch execute stage and then execute the instruction at 301 for fetch execute two and then execute the, the 302 for fetch three execute three. At that point, the program counter would be 303, but you don't have a value, right? So if the program counter ever gets to um, a memory address that you're not given the contents of, you're done with that problem, okay? Um, but likewise, if there is a jump instruction, you could have an infinite loop. So you could end up filling out all four of these fetch execute stages and the program counter is pointing back to 300 or something. But you don't, have, you don't have to do any more than four fetch executes for any of the problems, even if there's an infinite loop. All right, so just fill those out. Sometimes you might only fill out the first three of the four. Does that make sense? Um, one final thing, uh, if you do remember kind of your machine architecture course, uh, you might have learned about one's complement or two's complement. So there's different ways that a computer architecture might represent um, signed integers uh, in order to, you know, represent them in order to be able to do manipulations like add, subtract, multiply of signed integers. We're not using, the, our hypothetical machine doesn't use, two's complement is, is what's normally used in most machine architectures like an Intel um, or uh, an AMD processor or uh, the, the new Mac M1s probably use, most all the general purpose computers will use something called two's complement. We're using something simpler in this, um, in our books, machine uh, defined hypothetical machine architecture. We use a simple sign magnitude format. So a, a one bit of the 16 is the sign bit. Uh, and then the other 15 bits represent the magnitude, okay? So if the sign bit is zero, so for like these, the, the, the most significant bit, since the lat, since the most significant digit is zero, that means the, the, the first four bits, the, the first four most significant bits must all be zero. So since the most significant bit is zero, these are um, both positive, right? Um, But um, I guess I didn't have an, an example here, but um, for example, let me, uh, I should have opened up one of these in a, in a Word document or something. But um, for example, if I have like a negative five, right, um, in, uh, or let's say negative three, right? So negative three hexadecimal, um, or a positive three hexadecimal would be, you know, zero, zero, zero for the first 12 bits and then the magnitude three, which is, so th these are all, right? So, you know, hexadecimal, we might represent that as zero, 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 three, binary, it looks something like that if we expand all these out, right? Uh, but negative three, um, in um, binary, according to our machine architecture, has to be like that, right? So we, we represent a negative number, the, the 15 bits of the magnitude, and the first bit represents the sign, positive or negative, and one means negative, right? So uh, what is that in hexadecimal? Anybody want to? Anybody want to answer? And, and a hint, it's not that. That's incorrect. You might be familiar with, I uh, probably should be kind of representing that, that these are actually hex values. So, so, uh, so the actual, you know, hex representation of negative three in our hypothetical machine, if you, if you represent it as a hex instead of a binary, is 8003 because 1000 is eight hexadecimal. Right. So that, anyway, that's negative three. If and, and, you know, likewise, then, as this hint is trying to say here, if you get a negative result, make, make certain that you represent it correctly uh, using our side magnitude format in hexadecimal. So all the values you have in these uh, that you fill out need to be hexadecimal and you need to be correctly representing negative numbers using the side magnitude format defined for the hypothetical machine. Um, 
where the first bit is one if it's a negative, and then the other 15 bits are the, the, the magnitude of the value. All right. Um, anybody want to ask any questions about the problem set? So is this due tomorrow, right? Yeah, it's due tomorrow. So um, yeah, for these kind of online classes tomorrow by midnight, I'll I'll grade these uh, probably early in the morning. So you know, I guess technically you can go a bit later, but um, but I might be grading stuff late. So it is good to, to get it done tomorrow or you know the day of the deadline if at all possible. Don't don't rely on me not grading till nine or ten in the morning. Um, so but but yeah, and the first programming assignment is due then on uh, Thursday. Uh, by midnight. Okay. Um, all right. So, yeah, I wanted to spend, you know, 20 minutes then kind of in general making some comments about the um, uh, practice assignment and doing, you know, using GitHub and Git and stuff like that. So, uh, I guess let me get my BS code started here. Oops. Um, I should have started that ahead of time. Um, I, um, like I was saying, you know, feel free to ask questions. Um, if it's if it's a little bit like too individual, or or I need to maybe jump on you one on one, I might defer. You know, so in general, keep keep sending uh, email to me or Mr. Singh as well, or both of us. Uh, I, some people, the most common problem right now, well, um, I mean, some people, you know, are, are still not quite um, understand what we mean by running things in dev containers and stuff like that. Uh, at least one person is, is probably having some permission problems on Windows. Um, I'll try and describe that. Uh, but uh, I think I know some workarounds for that. I'm still working uh, uh, with people on that. The, I, I've, I've used these dev containers, but this is the first time I'm trying to use them um, um, completely. Uh, for this class here. So, um, so let me show you kind of the steps as if we were starting an assignment. So if, if um, you know, if you've got your dev container up, um, uh, I'm kind of going to go from there, although let me step back and remind you of a couple of things. So, you know, I've already gotten my secure, my, my secure shell key generated. So, one thing that was described in those videos is you do need to run the SSH keygen command from a command line. I've already done that. Uh, and then whatever your home directory is, like on Windows or whatever, it's going to be it's going to be C colon something. For me, it's home dash. Um, but whatever your home directory is, there should be a file in a hidden subdirectory called dot ssh and the file should be called id underscore rsa dot pub okay so you need to get that public key to your github account right so i'm going to be using um i'm going to be using a dummy um github account that i'm logged in here um called TME student. This is the one I used on the, the example videos here. But but yeah, if you're logged into GitHub, you know, the way to check that or do that is go to your settings, um, check your SSH keys, uh, and make certain you've got it added in here. Um, so uh, mine is actually this one um, here. But um, if you do, oops, if you do something like, um, Uh, if you want to check, so so if you cat out the raw key here, well, I mean, another way to check is, I mean, you can always just, uh, you know, copy that and redo it, right? So I could copy that, delete the old one, and and um, uh, create a new SSH key. But but yeah, the, the whole contents of that that um, um, that public key needs to be copied uh, from the file um, and. Uh, paste it in here, you know, and once you start getting more than one or two keys, it's good to always get it like a, a name. Um, so, all right. 
So that's one kind of step. You'll know that that step, uh, so I'll get that. So I'm going to clone the repository. So you'll know that you don't have your SSH key set up correctly uh, if you have problems with it saying that um, you can't, um, uh, you don't have permission to clone things, okay? So, um, so let me let me go ahead and uh, kind of do what you would normally do, but with the practice assignment. Um, so what you normally do when you're starting like assignment one or this assignment zero practice assignment is you have to find the URL that I give you. So by, by going to this URL, I'm going to copy this and paste it because um, I want to do it on my uh, my TMUC student GitHub account. Um, or the, but by, by going here, um, this uh, allows you to accept the GitHub classroom assignment. Basically, what this is going to do is going to create a GitHub repository for you. I, I've already, so what you should see uh, the first time you do this, it first asks you to associate uh, what your student name is with your GitHub ID. Um, so you should do that. And then the second thing, some people are, were, are incorrectly um, selecting an existing uh, team. You need to create your own team uh, for this assignment zero, especially. So, so when it gets to the second thing, asking for a team, don't select an existing team, uh, create a new team name and, and make a team name for you to work on uh, the assignment zero here. Uh, but I'm just going to re-accept. Once you do that, um, you will get um, a repository on GitHub created for you uh, on your account here. So if you miss getting this link to click on it, so, so you know, if, if you turn off your computer and go away, you need to get back to your repository. One way to do that is if you log into GitHub, search for, uh, you won't find it on your repositories because technically it was created in the CSCI 430 organization. So if, if you go and look under your organizations, you should see that you're a member of the CSCI 430 OS Summer 22. Uh, and that's the actual owner of the repository. So if you look in there though, you should see um, um, the repositories that you create for the assignment, including the one that I just, uh, re-accepted and recreated here in my assignment 00, zero TVC student team here. Okay. All right. So um, in general, then, um, you know, like I said, I'm assuming that you've got Visual Studio Code set up. I'm assuming that you have correctly installed the remote containers extension in your VS Code here. If you have remote containers installed, uh, you should have another extra on the what, what do they call this here they call this the um um uh the the side the primary sidebar so you should end up with a new thing from having the remote uh, remote extensions um remote containers extensions installed called the remote explorer which allows you to see your uh dev containers um so um i've got a couple here i'm going to go ahead and delete my assignment zero zero container so I can um, um, uh, recreate it, uh, reopen my project in my assignment zero zero in the dev container here. So. Um, oh, um, yeah, you do, you should have, uh, um, I skipped over, but you, there, are, there is some additional Git configuration that you need to do besides getting the SSH key in there. Um, I thought I had it in the written description for assignment zero. I'm sure I, I, I showed it in the um, uh, the video. Uh, you should you should set your your, your Git username uh, and password. So um, that is something like um, uh, you have to open up a terminal on your host machine, uh, like like you did this SSH key gen. Um, and if you want to, you can do like a git config dash list to see the configurations. But you should set a, a global configuration of the user name. Please use your real name, the, the name that um, both here for your git config and in your GitHub account, please use your real name, the one that's in your um, the, the grade book for um, our class. Right, so that's another thing that you can configure on GitHub um, in your settings. 
so those should be like general account kinds of things. So um, not username, but um, uh, so, so have, use your real name here on your public profile. Um, uh, and another thing is that the, the email address that you created your GitHub account with, so this is my email address here, that should match the git config um, configuration here. So mine doesn't match here, but I, I, uh, I do change it elsewhere. So, you know, if you configure your username, um, Um, it should match what you had in um, GitHub uh, for this here. All right. All right. Anyway, um, there's kind of a checklist. I thought there was a checklist here on these assignments. Um, yeah, kind of like this. So, you know, so far I've shown um, accepting the assignment on GitHub using the URL from our uh, D2L uh, classroom. Uh, um, so yeah, in order to do this next step to clone, we, we want to clone the repository using the SSH URL. So you do have to have your SSH, at least you have your, your public key copied to your GitHub account, right? So what this step means um, is, um, uh, what, what I think it's best to do is uh, you want to clone the repository first locally and then open it up in a dev container. That, that works best for me usually. So here's what I, how I normally do this. So I open up the file explorer um, on the sidebar or the, um, the, the source control uh, viewer and do a clone repository. Uh, now, we need the URL to be posted in here. So I think some people uh, miss this, but make certain you need to go to your repository pull down the code, uh, but make certain that you're not copying the HTTP URL. If you copy this one, it'll clone your repository, but um, it's read only. Uh, so when you try to do a push, you'll get errors that you can't push the repository there. So when you clone it, you want to clone it using your SSH. So I'll just copy that um, and go back to visual code and paste that in there, right? Um, and then you should select, um, I want to select um, a directory on my local system. So you have to be a little bit careful here if you've already got running containers or create containers before. So for me, sometimes it doesn't give me the option. So home VS code is not my, that, that's that's a directory in a dev, con, in my current open dev container instead of um, on my local system. So make certain you put it, I, I want to put it in my case into my home uh, dash repos directory. Right. So um, I'm going to stop here. So um, I found that the way to do that um, is, um, I think this might be a little bit of a bug in Visual Studio Code, at least what I'm seeing, but I might um, need to just first open up some other folder. Um, so when I do an open folder, um, um, uh, so I, I needed that option when I was trying to clone, but I, I don't get it sometimes when I'm running a dev container. So, but if I do an open folder, I usually get that option and I can open up something random um, just as a regular folder instead of in a dev container. Um, and um, um, right. Uh, and, and at this point, we don't want to reopen that in a container. So let, let's leave that. But 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 basically, once I've done that, uh, usually it works better for me to do the, um, uh, if I do a close folder now. So we'll close the folder um, and try to do the clone again from the SSH URL. Um, for me, that, so this is the important thing is that uh, instead of, um, having me select something that was actually in a dev container, it's it's popping up a, a regular file browser so I can uh, um, create the repository on my um, uh, my actual local machine, so in a local folder. So I, I usually put all my repositories in a directory called repos. Um, oh, I've already, I'm going to have to delete this first here before I can do uh, anything. So just a second, because I had the old repository here. Um, Let me delete that out. And 
and let's try again here. So. There we go. Actually, let me cancel that. Let's, let's do that step again just to make certain that we're we'll try it. So let's try it one more time. So let me clone repositories, use the SSH URL, which is going to be something like git at GitHub. Um, you want to get it cloned into your local host machine. So uh, you need to be able to find your directory. Um, and now I should be fine because I don't have that assignment 00, zero TMEC student team which is the repository I'm trying to um, clone here. So we'll select that. If it works, you should get um, a message that uh, would you like to open uh, the, the local folder. If you try to clone using the SSH key and you instead get an error, most likely you don't have your SSH key public key set up quite correctly here. So, so yeah, you might get like a get host key verification um, um, so, you know, the first thing to check on that is that um, you um, check your, your public key in your GitHub account. Um, this one here. And if necessary, you know, delete any key that you have, maybe even redo your key gen um, and copy it again. Um, um, okay, so once you clone it successfully, um, then um, um, I want to go ahead and open the folder uh, locally. It, it gave me the option. I, I was too slow. I didn't. You could. It should pop it up and say, "Do you want to open this folder?" Um, but if you if you don't have it open, you can open it up. So the, the difference between uh, opening folder or opening a folder in a container is if I just do a regular open folder, it's going to be opening it not in a dev development container, but just running with my regular host machine. Okay. So, so here, if I do just regular open folder and open up that folder, I've actually got it on my host machine, but it's not actually running in a container. Now, for these assignments we're going to be doing for this class, there's a special dev container subdirectory. It should detect that, uh, and you should be able to, to reopen in container, and then you'll get it in the dev container like you want, right? Uh, but again, uh, if, if, um, if you don't get this or you're too slow and that goes away, um, you should. You don't want to clone the repository in container volume. Um, you, I think, you do need to use the command palette. So, so if if, if you don't do it from the pop up that's given, uh, you can run that command. If you open up your command palette, Control Shift P, um, search for remote containers. Uh, and then, you know, you want to uh, open the folder in a container. So it's um, it's this one here, uh, Rural Containers Open Folder and Container, right? So if you select that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to reopen it um, in a dev container. Um, and, and yeah, I want to open up this assignment zero for this practice assignment. So. Um, what you should see, it's always maybe good to look at the, the log here. So it's actually, it's actually running a Docker container, configuring it. Um, um, uh, uh, the first time you do this, it might have to download some stuff. Usually that doesn't take quite so long the second and subsequent times that you do this. Um, but you might want to look that you don't have any, any kind of weird errors or anything on the log as it's trying to open up your container here. Um, So one another way to check that, I mean, right now that I've opened up my container, if I look in the remote explorer, you should see that that container that you open is the one with the green check mark. That means that's the container that's running. So I'm actually running. Uh, uh, I've got my folder open in this running container here. Right. Um, and um, so once you've got it cloned. And running in the container, um, uh, these steps here that I'm doing, uh, you do want to confirm that everything builds and runs correctly. Okay, so at this point, everything should build and run. Um, 
you should always be able to, to run things by hand with the build system in the container. So the container has all the, the, the compiler tool chain for you to build the stuff. It has uh, uh, the, the, the tools for running the test and doing tests. Um, it has the tools for formatting code, things like that. Uh, it has the build system defined in there. Um, you should be able to open up a terminal in your dev container. You'll know that your, your dev container, if uh, usually your um, home directory is going to be something just like, like workspace something, and you're going to be running as a user VS code here. Um, but you should be able to do um, all of the, uh, the, the build system kind of targets are set up for you. If you want to get a list of all of them, you can do a make help. But but the first thing to check after you're cloned and you're in your repository is, can I actually build cleanly, right? So uh, you can try doing a make clean, followed by a make all or just a make. So the default target is to do the make all, which should build everything. Um, the, the, the catch two is the unit test framework that we're using. It's kind of big, so it might take a little, a little bit of time, especially if, a, if you have a slower computer to um, compile that, but that only ever needs to be compiled once, usually. Um, it's a make or make all, and then make unit tests should run, should always run tests, uh, although for this practice assignment, there weren't actually any tests to find, but it, but it should uh, be able to, there's a test executable created, and it should be able to run that, all right? Um, another thing I, I like to, I mean, you know, I, I, I don't like to, to do all this stuff by hand. So for, for um, being more productive, uh, I usually, th these are kind of the three main things that I want to do, make, clean, make, and then uh, run my unit tests. So I usually um, add those to uh, keyboard shortcuts. Unfortunately, um, as far as I can find out, um, there, there's a file called keeponuse.json in your .vs code here, but it doesn't actually use these um, for reasons. I guess you can't have key bindings defined for individual folders or individual projects. So you really have to make these key bindings, put them into your global one. So what I normally do is I just take these, copy these here from the key bindings JSON file that you should find in the project. Uh, and then add those to my key binding. So if, if you go to the gear icon uh, and look for keyboard shortcuts, and then over here, if you look for the open keyboard shortcuts, this will open the key bindings JSON that's your global key bindings JSON. And, and when the first time you look at this, if you've never used VS Code before, this will probably be blank. Uh, there shouldn't be anything in there. Um, so what you want to do is, is, is um, copy those in there. You have to be careful that you maintain the, the correct JSON format here. So all opening have to have closes for, for square and curly braces and things like that, right? So all this is doing is supposedly adding key bindings so that control shift, shift C will do the make clean. Control shift B will do the default build task, which is to do the make all. And control shift T will do the default run unit tests, um, which is the make unit tests here. So. Um, I, I find that this is a little bit sticky sometimes. Somebody, somebody else was having problems with this. Uh, you know, make certain that you save that after you modify that. You might have to restart VS Code. Uh, but yeah, for me, it doesn't always immediately um, come up. So uh, the other thing is that these keyboard key bindings um, only work inside of an editor. So if I, uh, so I normally like start by opening up the tests right away, assignment zero tests, uh, and then trying them from there. Um, so like um, they should be working now though. So like if I do control shift C um, and I have focus in the editor, it should run the, the make clean. Uh, that's the key binding on that. And then control shift B uh, should do the, the build, build all. And then control shift T should run the unit test. All right. Um, another quick thing to, to maybe check out here um, is, is that uh, the, Code formatting. So there's a uh, there's a defined style class style for for code for this class here. That's defined in the C lang format. This depends on the um, um, 
uh, the, the C++ IntelliSense being correctly uh, installed uh, as an extension in your dev container. So what, what that means though, is that uh, if the code auto formatter is running, if you type in code like X equals five with no spaces or no formatting or no indentation, and if you hit save, it should reformat on save to the defined um, uh, uh, code style format that's defined in the C lang format. So, uh, so each open and cl closing curly brace on a line of its own, white space before and after um, binary operators and uh, uh, other things. Um, all right, it's a good thing to check that 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 your intelligence. So another thing is if your intelligence is working, you know it, it should flag um, undefined variables, and so you should see squiggles along things as you're typing, as parsing stuff. So, um, all right, and. Um, And then at this point, you know, um, um, I, there are, you know, you're going to learn a little bit about using GitHub if you haven't used it before or taken my uh, data structures class. So I encourage you to use kind of standard practices. So one thing to do is uh, each task that we want to work on, we want to have what's known as an issue in there. So, so um, I've got issue templates, so you don't actually actually have to write up the issue for you. Uh, but if you go to issues um, and do a new issue, if I want to start working on task one, we can um, uh, create the new issue. So we've got an issue for the task one. Um, and then um, we're going to be using what's known as a pull request. So there's, there should always be a pull request called feedback created for you for these assignments. Uh, but this is where everything that you commit is going to show up in this feedback pull request. So this is where I'm mainly going to be looking um, that for the work that you do is, is correctly submitted um, and committed and pushed to GitHub. Um, but but yeah, um, that issue, if I wanna start working on issue one, um, I, might want, I wanna go ahead and link it to this feedback pull request here. So I see it as something that I'm working on on this uh, feedback pull request. Um, so yeah, it takes a few seconds to update, but it should update there. Um, Okay, so that was all the kind of the 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 getting started stuff here, I believe. Um, so so yeah, we did kind of all the the four things you have to do. So um, I'm not gonna get I'm not gonna go again through the actually doing the assignment. So that, I mean, again, this is really practice. It's not it's not meant to be kind of worked on, but um, um, just to to start you on this and then I'm going to kind of try and open up for questions but the, the normal workflow then is to work on task two you'll want to define the or task one you'll want to define this uh, the C macro which will enable the test cases as soon as you do it, the reason why I have to guard these is because you need to implement usually functions that aren't that we don't have actual implementations yet in the code so as soon as you define that um, your project will stop building right so if I do a Control shift C to clean, and then a control shift B is going to complain about um, uh, is prime is not defined, right? So the normal first step, as I kind of showed, is that um, um, sometimes I'll give you the, the, the declaration for the function or the member function, um, but sometimes I won't. So, so like here, if it's not defined, we first have to add a declaration into the include file for the, um, the primes.hpp. So um, this function is supposed to return a Boolean result true if, if the number is prime and false if it's not. And it takes a single parameter's input, so a value to be tested, uh, which is a, a regular integer, all right? Um, so this is an example of a function prototype. Uh, prototypes or declarations always go into header files, prime.hpp in this case. As soon as you add that, you know, since we include primes.hpp, that's enough information for the compiler to know how to actually use the function. So now it can actually compile the assignment zero test.cpp if you try it. So if we compile, 
um, it, it actually compiles the, the object file for the tests, but when it tries to link together the actual test executable, um, um, it fails because we haven't actually implemented that function yet. So implementations always go into the uh, source directory, a .cpp file. So um, for this assignment, um, um, there's a primes.cpp. The, um, the, you know, the signature always has to match between the, the function prototype um, and um, where you implement it. So I, what I normally do is I normally copy this. I, I copy my declaration and then paste it. Uh, another thing, I'll talk later about documentation. Uh, so for the first assignment or two, I kind of give you function documentation. So you should put the, the implementations at the correct place where there's function documentation for it. So this is supposed to be the, um, the, the, the location where the implementation of this prime goes in the primes.cpp, right? So the difference between the declaration and implementation is instead of having a semicolon, we have an open and colon curly braces and we actually put the code to implement is prime in here. But our goal when you're first starting a task is just to get back to a compiling and running state so I can compile it and run the test. And then we can start implementing things, right? So if I just put in like a stub, so I always return true, I should be able to compile. I'll do a clean build again and recompile everything. Should be able to compile without getting any compile errors or link errors. Um, and then I should be able to run the tests, right? Another thing we do have, um, the, the uh, test mate extension installed for these catch two unit tests uh, now in this dev container. So you should have another thing on your sidebar for these testing here. So another way to interact with these unit tests is if you open this up, um, you'll see that um, um, the, the test runner is running the, 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 the test executable here. Uh, but also um, it should, oh, I need to rerun it here in the test, test runner. But if I rerun it here, um, um, it will run the test and it'll add in um, feedback um, uh, in the actual unit test file, right? So this is basically saying that um, this first test failed because, uh, you know, again, it's expecting false, but we, we return true, right? So it's, it's passing any place where we're expecting a true result. So any, any place that was a prime number, but it's failing everywhere where there's a, a false result. So. Um, all right. So yeah, kind of, um, uh, let me see if I can answer some questions now. So, so uh, I, I might have to go work kind of individually. So um, I have one person, uh, two people um, having some problems with their SSH keys. So uh, yeah, so I mean, if you did double check, um, uh, one thing you can try, you know, uh, I mean, if your secure shell key is correct, I mean, sometimes there can be issues that there's some permission issues people are seeing, but you should always be able to, uh, on your host machine, do like a git clone, okay? So for example, uh, if I go back, uh, if I got my secure shell key set up, if I go back and copy that key, but if I just open up um, a terminal on my host system, you know, um, and oops, and this will uh, work, you know, open up a command terminal on Windows or open up a, a terminal on Linux or Mac. Um, and if I go to A directory. I'll just do temp because I don't really want to keep this. I'm just testing it out. So, so if I do temp, you should be able to run the git commands from a terminal on your host mas machine. And you know, assuming that you've got that pub key correctly copied from your IDR say pub into GitHub, if I do a git clone of that SSH URL, um, if it works there, then you do have your SSH key. Um, set up correctly. If it doesn't work there, if you get an error message, uh, there's still something wrong here, but this is kind of the, the most direct thing. I mean, you know, you're using Git, you're not using it inside of a container or anything. Um, and yeah, if you're getting a permission error on the SSHK here, uh, definitely something is wrong with the, you don't, don't have it, the, the right key right there. But if it works there, um, I mean, in theory, uh, you in theory as a workaround, you could use your Git commands to, to clone, uh, make uh, commits and push them uh, from your 
a, a regular term on your host machine and do your development and testing uh, in, a, in the dev container so that you have the development and test container to the list. Not quite as efficient, but that might get you started enough that you could uh, work on the assignment zero. So. Um, so I bet I want to throw out any other kind of general questions or help here. I think I'm going to ask people to like email me some requests and maybe I'll try and set up some individual sessions for some people here this afternoon uh, that are working on um, getting the dev container stuff set up and working. But if you have something that might be a little bit more general, you know, about, um, yeah, I mean, I didn't show, for example, uh, actually pushing this commit. I mean, if you've got your Git stuff working in your container, uh, it is convenient to use the source control. So to, to do it inside of Visual Studio Code in a dev container, if you go to the source control tab, you should see in, any files that you've modified uh, should show up um, um, as being modified as what the M means here. Um, uh, if you want to, you can see exactly what um, changes you made. So if I click on it in the source control, I'll get a diff view. So in, in the original repository, my header file looked like this. And now the difference my modified is I've added in the um, uh, the declaration for my first task is prime function here. So, um, but I can make a commit and push this by, um, um, I wanna go ahead and push all these files with my stub function here. So, you know, I can, I can use the plus at, at the top here to commit all the modified files. This actually stages the commits uh the 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 the, um, the corresponding on that on the command lines do a git add right so like a git add would um uh if i if i had a modification to that file would uh would stage add um from the command line uh, so once you stage those you actually haven't made a commit yet uh, so you should uh, you always use good um commit messages. So a good commit message at least has a title. And then one blank line and then one or more sentences of description. So, so we completed a example of a stub for the is prime function. Uh, this stub compiles and runs tests though not all tests are currently passing something like that right i mean try i mean i'm not going to really uh, uh give you bad give you marks off for not doing these but, but you know try and learn good habits about using git and making commits so once you have a good commit message the check is what does the git commit so the corresponding on that if you've got things staged you do a git commit that will um, actually create the commit on the command line. Uh, but at that point, you're not done because when you have a commit, it's still local. So you have to do a sync to push the changes. So the way to do that is to, to, to hit the sync changes here. That's, it, that is actually doing what's known as a git push um, to, to actually push any local commits to the, the repository. Um, all right, but I'll sync it, or you can also click down here. This will do a, a like a push and a pull, I think, simultaneously. So what to look for for this? So the, I mean, I everything I've done so far here uh, in my dev container, I can't see that work that you've done. So the only thing that I care about in grading is um, I'm going to be looking at your actual GitHub account into the feedback pull request. And what I should see is your is your commits pushed here, showing up in your feedback pull request. So I'll see the commit here, and I will see that it runs the same test, but it runs them um, on GitHub in what GitHub calls this a uh, workflow auto grader, right? So so I should see if I open up the details um, that um, um, your test of is prime is correctly um, um, undefined. So it's actually running tests, uh, but it's fair. And, and you know, it's, it's good to double check this. You should see that it's always failing exactly the same tests here that as it is um, on your local repository that you did the commit, or it's not failing anything if it wasn't failing anything for the commit that you created and pushed here. But yeah, in this case, uh, we are running the is prime test, but it's, um, um, 
one test case and 13 assertions are actually failing, which was should be the same thing that I was getting uh, um, when I run the tests uh, here in my local uh, commit. One, one test case and 13 assertions failing. Uh, Um, all right. So what were the commands that you did uh, to run the first time you open an assignment in the container? Um, you mean to, uh, to, to open, the, uh, yeah, open the folder and container? Is that what you mean? So, so um, um, let's try that again. So what, I, what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to close th this container and open up a different container. Um, or, or no, I'm, I'm just going to open up like a local, a different folder. So I'm just going to do like an open folder so I can close this container and open up some folder locally on my system. So, um, like, um, I'll just open up assignment five here. The reason why I did that is just, um, I want to, um, if I look at my containers now, that assignment zero container isn't running anymore. You don't see the green check mark. So I'm, I'm, I've actually got that that folder open, uh, but it's not running in a dev container. It's running just as a regular open folder here in Visual Studio Code, right? Uh, that'll allow me to kind of like delete that, okay, uh, uh, container and recreate it. So um, if I want to open up, if I've already done the clone step, which I have, if I want to reopen up that folder in in like a, a new container, uh, we can do that open folder uh, in con, uh, container trick. So, um, um, so one way to do that, let me just show you this again. So another way to do that. So I can do like a file open folder here to open it like a regular folder, um, and I'll open up that assignment zero that I've been working on the assignment zero team, she's student team. So that that just opens it up as a regular folder, but it detects. This, it, it should automatically detect that it's configured to run in a dev container. So if, if you see this pop up, another way to open it up is to say reopen it in a container. So that should reopen that um, folder uh, in my development container, which is what I want here. Um, and to check that again, if I go look at the remote explorer containers, I should see the assignment zero container now uh, with the green check mark, meaning, meaning that's the container that's running, right? And now that I'm in that, I should be able to do the the all those initial commands. So, um, so for example, if I open up a terminal, um, I should be able to do make clean because all the build system is configured to run with the, the the build system tools, the make tools, and other stuff, and compiler inside of this uh, Linux dev container environment. So, I should be able to do make clean followed by make to build everything followed by make unit test. All right, did I answer the, the question about the commands to run the first time when you open the? Um, other questions? Yeah, so yeah, I mean, that's your basic workflow is going to be always be, you don't always have to make clean because basically make, make clean, uh, if, if you look at it, I mean, all it's doing is like deleting all of the build products. So it deletes all the object files that were built and stuff. So I usually, I usually don't always do a make clean. I usually only do a make clean if something seems kind of screwed up, or if I really have done something kind of major and I want to make certain everything is rebuilt, right? So, so your, I mean, your basic workflow is is probably just make a small change, like um, um, change my stub to return false, but then just do a build or make all so, or control shift B. Um, so this will only rebuild what's necessary. So since I modified um, primes.cpp, uh, it should only rebuild that. Um, but anyway, um, and then then run the tests. Or yeah, for me nowadays, um, I use the the test runner. So after I do that, uh, I, I open up the test runner and uh, rerun those. Uh, so now that I changed the false, um, all the other all the other things are failing uh, that were passing before, but the things were passing were failing. So, um, but yeah, those are your three kind of major things.
we might talk about some of these other things you can do later on, although they're not really central to this class. There are some other stuff um, that's part of this build system, um, although we will need to learn also about the system tests and running the simulation um, from the command line. But I'll, I'll do that on Thursday, I think, or, or Wednesday, our next help session. So. All right, yeah, it is over an hour here already. Um, so I might go ahead and wrap up the session and post this video. Um, if people, again, that are watching this uh, live or later, um, uh, I do require everybody to get the assignment zero either done or give me a report on what your situation is, why, what is stopping you. Uh, send me some emails not, I'll, I'll, if, if you need some, um, uh, me to take an individual look and I'll try and do that and or send you off to um, Mr. Singh uh, if I'm getting too many of those. Um, all right, let's end that session um, and I will see you guys later then.